What's up everybody? Welcome back to my YouTube channel, Richard on Data. If this is your first time here, my name is Richard, and this is the channel where we talk about all things data, data science, statistics, and programming. Subscribe for all kinds of content just like this, and hit the notification bell so YouTube notifies you whenever I upload a video. A lot of people in the data science community, we love to talk about statistics, machine learning, deep learning, all that fun stuff. But we don't talk enough about communication, which is an equally important thing. I personally think of data science as the intersection between statistics, programming, domain expertise, and communication. So it's an incredibly important piece of the puzzle. It's worth exploring exactly what this means, as well as just some overall good principles and practices for communication in data science. A lot of the things in this video that I'm going to talk about are generally good practice in any field, but there are just certain specific things that I have seen data scientists fall into, and there are certain responsibilities that we all have in the data community to most effectively add value to our organizations and to just avoid the negative stereotypes that we sometimes fall into of being nerds, which we are, but we need to be useful nerds. So without further ado, I'm going to get into five tips I have for being an effective communicator in the data science field. As a disclaimer, these are just my opinions. They've been shaped over time by my own experiences and anecdotes, as well as some research. So hopefully it's a useful perspective for you that provides some interesting food for thought. Our first item on this list is all about mindset. And it's about shifting from thinking about technical needs to thinking about business needs. Most people in the data science world have an advanced technical degree, but there comes a shift at a certain point where they have to apply the skills they learned in school to real world business problems that are faced by their particular industry. And now us data people, a lot of us have an instinct to talk about super technical things like maybe we want to bin our continuous features into categorical buckets. We need to do one hot encoding on our data set. And oh, our data set is structured so that we should probably try some sort of longitudinal approach. Things like that. Here's the problem. Most of our clients honestly couldn't care less. The thing you have to keep in perspective is that the technical end of things is only useful insofar as it can generate information and value for somebody else. And then at least if you're working in the private sector, that information and value is only useful if it can generate your company revenue or savings. That picture is a little bit different if you're working in the public sector, but the same principles apply, just for a different end goal usually than money. A lot of people you're going to be talking to, they think about outcomes and the bottom line all day long. And I'm going to be blunt, they're really busy and they don't have time to get boggled down with the technical details. They just want to know that you got to your results in a reasonable way and that you know what you're talking about. So in short, before you do any analysis, you need to understand what the purpose of it is, and you need to think about what kind of business metrics or KPIs, that is key performance indicators, that your work is aligned with. And to the extent you can, you want to understand the impact your work has on your organization, as well as making your results as actionable for your stakeholders as possible. And doing this is a fine art, which does require developing your domain expertise somewhat, but these are the things you want to be thinking of as you work on data science projects. The second thing is to state and be upfront about your key assumptions. This is a huge one. Now there are certain things, such as normality for a t-test, which are technically assumptions, but are completely irrelevant almost all of the time. But then there are other things like, where is your response variable coming from? What filters are you using on the data set? Which are incredibly important and are going to influence any sort of results you produce in a very dramatic way. First of all, this is a CYA kind of thing because your work is always going to come under some degree of scrutiny, but stakeholders in particular do want to understand what sorts of assumptions you're making. They're almost invariably going to have some amount of questions for you, and just understanding and stating your assumptions up front is going to prepare you for those questions. And you also want to elicit feedback on your assumptions, because once again, your assumptions can influence your work arguably more than anything else. But it's also just generally a thing that builds trust too, because it really indicates that you're thorough and that you ask the right types of questions. 
On that note, item number three is empathize and build good relationships with your stakeholders. It's important to understand the meaning of the word empathy. So to do that, let's consult my good friends Miriam and Webster. According to the dictionary, empathy is defined as the action of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experience of another, of either the past or present, without having the feelings, thoughts, and experience fully communicated in an objectively explicit manner. The field of UX, that is, user experience, is centered all around that idea, empathy. And there's tons in the field to unpack, so much so that you can spend months or years doing it. And I'm absolutely not saying that aspiring or current data scientists also need to be UX professionals, but it's worth educating yourself a little bit on how the design thinking process works. In particular, one tool that it's useful to understand or at least be aware of is the persona. This is from an Adobe blog, and they define a persona as an archetypical user whose goals and characteristics represent the needs of a larger group of users. They say usually a persona is presented in a one or two page document, like the one you can see in the example below. Such one to two page descriptions include behavior patterns, goals, skills, attitudes, background information, as well as the environment in which a person operates. Designers usually add a few fictional personal details in a description to make the person a realistic character, so on and so forth. So for this particular persona, there's a lot of information on motivation, personality, goals, frustrations, technology. And again, this is not one single individual. It's kind of a representation of a number of very similar types of individuals. I'd say the most important things are here. Number one, you need to understand what people's pain points are and what they care about. And those real human things should be the focal point of any sort of deliverable that you produce. Some people are more or less technical than others, and I think it's totally fair to try and gauge that out on an individual client by client basis. And then of course, it's just a reality of dealing with human beings that if they know you and you've formed some sort of relationship with them, they will be way more likely to trust your work and want to take action based on it. So yes, data science is not a purely technical field. There's a giant human and psychological component to it that you're not gonna be able to avoid. Item number four is to use simple visualizations. Visualizations are an extremely powerful tool. The cliche is that a picture is worth a thousand words, and that's particularly true in data science. And it's also estimated that 65% of the population are visual learners. Graphs also have the power to let the audience digest a much larger amount of information in a short period of time than something like a table would allow for. And there are some fairly well-established best graphical principles out there. Two books that I come back to again and again are The Visual Display of Graphical Information by Edward Tufday and Show Me the Numbers by Stephen Few. One of Tufte's biggest points is that so many graphs out there are full of useless, non-informative junk. He even coined a term for this. He called it chart junk. He also made a big point about what's called the ink to data ratio. And he really stressed that as much of the ink on the graph as possible should be used to show data. Now I do think there's an acceptable range of debate about graphical principles and it's certainly audience dependent, but by and large I do think most data scientists overestimate the ability of their audience to comprehend very complicated graphs. I have personally presented information to clients before who were confused by scatter plots, and I got questions as I was going through a presentation about did I control for some variable, when that variable they were talking about was the thing that was on the x-axis. I'm not saying that to make fun of people or to insult anybody's intelligence. I'm just really trying to put into perspective here that more complicated is almost never good. And of course, it is audience dependent. I do think that generally we're moving into an era where more and more visualizations are gonna be dynamic and interactive. So if you have the ability to put something together like that and your audience can very easily understand it, then more power to you, do it. But if you were to ask me for some graphical principles that work the vast majority of time they're put into practice, I would say the following. First of all, use the right graph for the job. 
If you're trying to visualize a trend of something changing over time, use a line plot. If you're trying to visualize the relationship between two variables, you need to use a scatter plot, etc. As much as possible, stay away from pie charts and bubble charts. They may look pretty, but from the standpoint of telling an easily comprehensible story, they suck. Use the simplest possible graph or graphs for the job. Don't clutter your graphs up with a bunch of crap. And then above all else, show the data and really think about what story or takeaway that you want your audience to come away with. Then a last item on this list is to tell engaging stories. You can't get away from the fact that in data science, whatever our deliverable is, whether it's a graph, a report, a model, whatever the case may be, we are telling a story and there's good and bad ways to tell stories. If you think back to the best stories you've ever heard, what comes to mind for you? Chances are at the beginning of that story you were hooked, that is something pulled you in, and then you were engaged as you went through, that is there wasn't a dull moment, you weren't bored, and then the ending was punchy, that is it didn't fall flat at the end. Well the same things are going to be true in storytelling and data science. When we talk about a hook and pulling your audience in, that's your context. You basically always want to start out by demonstrating to your audience why they should care. You want to use visuals because like I said, way more of the population than not can be considered visual learners. And once you've established that context up front, way less of your audience's energy is going to be wasted trying to decipher and comprehend what they're trying to look for in your output or in your graph. And then you need to end with recommendations and findings, and if there are any action items, you end with those too. Don't go out on a low note. So in summary, I often describe data science as being more of an art than it truly is a science, and the communication aspect of it is one of the biggest reasons for that. But I can tell you that, just from my own personal experience, there's a lot of people in the field who don't do this part of the job particularly well. So if you can get really good and excel at this, you really have a great opportunity to shine and to really stand out in your role. So thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it and you'd like to support my work, the best thing that you could do for me would be to share this video. Otherwise, at least consider smashing the like button. And then I'll see you all in the not-so-distant future. Until then, Richard, on data.